I think everybody likes the picture of God that God is just there and He'll just give you whatever you want. He'll just uh, bless you and bless you and you can be a dirty, rotten sinner all year long, but it's still expect to get something when you go, when you die, you just expect to go to heaven. There's a price for heaven. It's a very high price. And the truth is, is that Jesus did not in any way, shape, form, or fashion stutter when he said, he who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. This is a true statement. It's either a yes or a no. There's no middle ground. You're either a believer or you're not a believer. The price was the highest price. There is no one in this room that fully understands Though the words are there, a heart really can't connect and understand the value of our salvation. And when you start thinking of the value of something, you have to understand the price that was paid, the price that was willing to, to be given so that we could have salvation. There's a phrase that's going around today, and... I understand the grace of God. That is that God gives you what you don't deserve. Y'all understand grace? That's a true theological concept. Mercy is what you do not receive that you do deserve. How many of y'all messed up? Come on. How many of you messed up bad? Did you get what you deserve? Sometimes in life we do. Sometimes we don't. But when God gives mercy, you don't get what you deserve. Because His grace overrides. But there's this term that's going around called easy believism. Have y'all heard it? Oh, just say a little prayer, make a little thought. Take up God and say, I want to go to heaven one day. Now, you can live like a dirty, rotten scoundrel the rest of your life, and you're still going to go to heaven. <clears throat> Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. If you sow belief in God, if you sow trust in God, if you sow love for God, if you sow love to people that God loves, if you give yourself unto Him, listen to me now, the way He gave Himself unto you, you're good. You don't have to prove anything. It's not by works. It is by God's grace. But there are some people that just look to God like Santa Claus and they just say, give me, 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 give me. And by the way, leave me alone. We're supposed to come unto Him and we're supposed to follow Him. If you're going to come to Him, you're going to follow Him. And part of that comes with live for Him. It's just who we are as a Christian. I'm a new creation. Old things are passed away. Y'all good with that part? Well, I don't think too many Christians are. I think they want the new, but they like the old as well. I don't know why we hold on to things that we should get, get rid of. Some people, when they come to God, they say, prove it to me, prove it to me. Usually when I hear someone say that, their attitude is pretty much speaking for itself right then. They're trying to say, well, make it tried and true. I want to know, I want to know, I want to know. When the Lord came into my heart, I knew it. I've never doubted it. Lee Strobel wrote a book. He was a, a published, he was not a publisher, excuse me. He was a uh, writer for the Chicago Tribune. His wife got saved. He was going to prove that she was wrong. So he set out to prove her wrong, and in the process, he proved it right. Josh McDowell uh, was in college, saw a girl that he thought was cute. Amen, hallelujah, and praise God. 
He began a conversation with her and he said, why do you have that smile? You have the most beautiful smile. And she said, because Jesus Christ is my Savior and Lord. That's not what Josh McDowell wanted to hear. So he set out to prove that that girl was wrong and that he was right. He also wrote a book called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. And everything that he found to try to disprove ended up proving that Jesus was exactly who he said he was. Josh McDowell says there's over 300 prophecies written in the Old Testament that were fulfilled in the life of Christ. Now that goes beyond, if you start looking at the math there, it's amazing the odds of over 300 things written hundreds of years before coming true in one person. Isaiah 53 is one of these. The book of Isaiah is that God will take care of you. The children of Israel have been taken into captivity by Assyria. Most of the book, Isaiah is writing to them about that, that God would deliver them. He also says, but you're going to mess up again and you're going to be taken captive and taken to Babylon. But he says, I promise you that you'll come back. And he tries to, no, he doesn't try, he does, to convey that God's blessing comes in a person, the Son of God who would become the Son of Man. He would be called the Christ the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Savior of the world. Our world is full of religions. Our, full, our world is full of people who take advantage of religions. Sad to say, our world is full of people who try to make financial profit off of religions. But when God gave the gift of Jesus Christ, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have of everlasting life. When God gave that gift, the price tag was on his behalf. It cost him. We just want to be the beneficiaries of it. Praise God that we are. But today we're going to look at how Isaiah heard from God and how God described this Christ. Oh, such love. Oh, such love. Romans said, with someone so love." Would he give his life for another? In verse number three, God made it clear. Look at the price of God's love for mankind. This is the Christ. He is despised, rejected by men. Here's the phrase. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised. We did not esteem him. The word despised there means to hold in contempt. To dis have disdain. To look at with vile. To see one as despicable. When they saw the Christ... This was their judgment. He is vile. And they held him in contempt. They didn't give him any honor. They gave him disdain. He was rejected. That meant that they considered him. But when they considered him, they found him of no value. And they rejected him. It's like taking a piece of paper. I'm not going to take my notes, but I'll take your music, Mark, and just... I didn't mean anything by that, but just taking it and wadding it up and just throwing it away. No value. 
That's what they did to the Messiah. They saw him contemptible. But he says he was a man of sorrows. Sorrows means with anguish. Now, let's pause here. Who are we talking about? The God of creation, the God of no beginning, the eternal God. We're talking about the Alpha. But he's also the Omega. He has no beginning and he has no end. He is perfect in all things. He cannot do anything that is not perfect. He is good. He is very good. And in his place is called heaven. There was no pain. There was no sorrow. He created us. We considered him. And Adam and Eve wanted something else. And they wadded it up and threw it away. And it broke his heart. He is acquainted with grief. He had affliction. He had pain. He had pain of his soul. He was downcast. The word grief there means sickness. Have you ever been so overwrought in something that, that you literally got sick at it? Have you ever been in so much disgust or pain or, or everything came upon you and the oppression was so heavy that you would literally become sick at your stomach and throw up? Anxiety overwhelming you. Calamity, trouble, heartache. This is the man who came for us. He came to be king, but he allowed us to choose whether we would bow the knee or not. And every time someone does not bow the knee to him, but turns their back on him and walks away, it's over the love of God. It leaves a tear on his face because he wants to bless. He's a God who wants to give. And when we reject him, he knows our fate. And he knows that fate will break us. <clears throat> When I was in high school, um, I got bored. Um, I don't. I want to be careful how I say this, um, but I got to tell the truth. Y'all okay with that? I got to skip in school. I was bored. I'd rather go fishing. Kirby, I'd go bowling. I played golf. I got pretty good at it. <clears throat> and the principal called my dad. Dirty, rotten, scoundrel. <laughs> and he said, I don't care what Brian's grade point average is. If the boy don't start coming to school, he's not going to graduate. And my dad had the conversation with me. Y'all know those conversations where you sit down and they look at each other? And my dad had the look. How many of your parents had the look? Y'all know what I'm talking about. And he explained it to me. And he said, son, promise me you're going to start going to school. Yes, sir. You have my word, I promise. And I went to school for a little while. And one of my friends said, it was one of those spring days. Y'all know those days? You're tired of winter. Let's go play. I don't remember what. I don't know if it was going fishing or golf. I really don't remember. <clears throat> oh, come on, Brian. Oh, come on. So you know what I did? And the crazy thing about this was their plans changed and I was on my own. So I went to the, I worked at the recreation center. I coached kids. Um, so I went over to the recreation center and I was shooting ball in the gym. And the doors, those double doors opened. 
And I could see a silhouette of a five foot seven man. And the ball just kind of slowly bounced away. And I walked to my dad, and this were his words You gave me your word. I'm so disappointed in you. And I felt like the world had just fallen in on me. Y'all know what I'm talking about? By the way, I went back to school. I did graduate. There are no pictures to prove it, but I did graduate. When we look at God with disdain, it makes him very sad. When he thinks of all that he did for us and we only cared about ourselves, Look how it changes here. Verse 4. It says, He was, surely He has borne, excuse me, He has borne our griefs. He's carried our sorrows. The word borne means to take away, to carry away, to endure that. Here's the word. Lay upon Him. We couldn't carry it. So he said, I'll come carry it. Jesus carried that burden. By the way, a burden that you'll never understand. You'll never have to be the perfect God who received what you did not deserve, but out of love he did it anyway. To the point of absolutely crushing. Literally, when Jesus was going up the hill at Calvary and He was bearing the cross, He was a man. He was carrying it. But He was so down. He was so beaten. He, he, as it says in, in, in verse 2, His visage was so marred. I, folks, He fell beneath the weight. He wanted to carry that cross up the hill, but literally, He could not bear it. My word for this year, y'all have heard me say this over and over and over again. My word for this year, I take one word a year and I try to fully learn what that word means. And this word for this year is trust. The word trust means literally this. If you want to look at the, 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 the biblical definition, it means to roll it over on the Jehovah. That's the Old Testament word. To take the burden and to roll it over on Him. We can't bear it. Y'all know what I'm talking about where the load is too heavy? You would do everything feasibly possible for that loved one. You, you, in that circumstance, you would give your life for them, but, but you can't. And it has to be rolled over on Him. Jesus said, let me come and take that burden from you. He bore our grief He carried our sorrows. And we esteemed Him stricken. The word esteem means to uh, value. So we valued Him not. We saw Him with no regard, no worth. We saw Him as stricken, defeated, Please hear this next phrase. That his fate befell him. There is a very smart man that I listen to from time to time. He really talks about politics a lot. He's Jewish and his name is Ben Shapiro. Anybody ever heard of Ben Shapiro? He has a podcast, one of the most viewed podcasts in our country. He is Jewish. And in 2019 on his podcast, actually it wasn't his podcast, it was a podcast for a man named Joe Rogan, who is uh, very much known by the UFC fighting. Um, this was his quote about Jesus on that podcast. 
He said Jesus was a revolutionary who got his just fate from the Romans. Then he made this statement. He got killed for his trouble. The one who was the Christ, over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament that this man is a student of, he said he was just an old, another revolutionary and he got what he deserved. He, he was trying to become a leader, but Rome just, here's the phrase, they just, he just got killed for his trouble. He was, dis, he was stricken. They esteemed him not. Please hear this. God allowed that pain on him. He allowed it. He was our sacrifice. Next Sunday, we're going to talk about the lamb. The sacrificial lamb. That is silent before it's ones that come and kill it. That was our Lord. What can wash away our sins, Mark? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing else would do. Listen, nothing else would satisfy. Revelation chapter 5 talks about who is worthy to come and take the book, the scrolls, and to open them up. The title deed to life, liberty, the title deed to our salvation. And they searched through heaven and no one was worthy to come and take the scroll and open it up. But then when sadness began to doom, one came forward as of a lamb as though it had been slain. That's our Messiah. He bore our griefs. He carried our sorrows. We esteemed Him stricken, smitten by God. God did this. He was afflicted because He was afflicted for us. Look in verse 5. He was wounded for our transgressions. Transgressions. One of the words that is translated in our Bible, sin. It, it, it literally means rebellion. The punishment for our choices. I chose wrong, he paid for it. I ran up a sin debt, he paid for it. I wanted what I thought was best for me. I didn't care about anybody else. I was selfish and prideful, and he paid for it. He was bruised for our iniquities. That word iniquities is also translated sin. It means it's hard to say this. Perversity. Depravity. Mischief. That which is twisted. You know, people poke fun of Christians. Call us narrow-minded and stupid. People look at us and say, you're not a logical thinker. And nobody, I know that there is unrest in other religions. Most of it's political. But have y'all noticed that it's free game to rebuke Christ in our Olympics? They saw no problem with Drag queens looking like the Lord's Supper. Oh, that was some other festival. That's a lie. You can see the picture and it looked exactly like it. And they approved that. This is also the people that approved a female, quote, female, a man who calls himself a female to be a boxer. And the, the opponent, she just got punched in the nose and said, I quit. Truth of the matter is, if he, she punched, he punched me in the nose, I'd probably quit too. I was raised that men don't hit women. 
They approve that. Perversity. There are some crazy things that are going on today in our society. In our broken, downtrodden society, a lot of hurt, a lot of people trying to find peace in the wrong places. It's sin. And it says there in verse 5, the chastisement for our peace, the correction, the discipline, the chastening of our peace was upon Him. The word peace means two sides going in opposite directions that are brought together. Sinful man, perverse, ugly, criminal, and a holy, loving God because of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary, we became whole with Him. Then that famous saying in verse 5, by His stripes, we are healed. I'm going to read these three verses again. And I want you to hear this descriptive word. He is despised and rejected by men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. This is us. He was despised. We did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, Yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by His stripes, we are healed. All, like we like sheep have gone astray. All means all, and that's all all means. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Nobody can make it on their own. We all had that trespasses, iniquity, sin. Yet, because of Him, though we went astray, we have turned everyone to His own way. The Lord has laid on Him the iniquity of us all. Sometimes, on Saturday night, so that the the message can be fresh on my heart. I will redo my notes. I want them to be not just on a piece of paper. I want them to be in my heart. Y'all understand? And I was in the living room. Jody was there and Lynn was there. Um, literally, this is the first time this spring and summer I've, I saw this, but we have hardwood floors and a bug came crawling off the floor or across the floor right towards me. Now, y'all don't get on the limb for that. We live in the woods. Y'all good? You pick on me, don't pick on her. She got up real quick and she went after it with a shoe. And she missed. And it went underneath the couch over there. I said, well, strike one, you know. We went on doing what we were doing. We didn't pick up the couch. And uh, I was sitting there and I got to this particular place. And as I got to this little place, that doggone bug came out again. <laughs> and this is the second time he was making a beeline right towards me. I was sitting over in the love, love seat. And without even thinking, you know what I did? I reached, got that shoe, and went, boom! I didn't miss. 
And I put the shoe back and I sat back. And the Lord, the Holy Spirit said to me, that's what they did to me. They crushed me. And I looked at that bug. Lifeless bug. And I realized that without thinking, I crushed it and I didn't care. And God gave me a little bit of hint of when He was on that cross. And He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That meant that my sin and your sin was laid on Him. And the holy God who can't picture sin, He can't look at sin, turned His back. And Jesus, for the first time in all of eternity, was alone. Feeling the full weight. Oh, how He loves you and me. Oh, how He loves you and me. He gave His life. What more could He give? Oh, how He loves you. Oh, how He loves me. Oh, how He loves you and me, despised and rejected. Oh, how He loves. Oh, how He loves. And I see this broken world with these broken people. They don't need another political movement. They need a Savior. They know we need somebody who has been tempted in all ways. Come on now. What's those next three words? Yet without sin. I'm going to say it again. He was tempted in all ways. The only one to walk this earth who was not worthy of all of that pain was the one who bore it. You ever heard the phrase, when he was on the cross, you were on his mind? He died for you. But three days later, he rose for you. And now he's at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for you. And when he comes back, he's coming back for me and for you. Praise God. Man of sorrows. I almost sang that song for you, but folks, I can't get through it. All I can say is when that song comes to an end, it says, Hallelujah. What a Savior. Oh, how He loves you and me. God had to turn His back on Jesus because He became our sin. Don't you turn your back on Jesus too.